I, I called this the path through the storm. We were in Melbourne last week for a funeral of a, of a family member and we had to pick up another family member from the airport, drive out to Yarra Glen and then back to Narry Warren, all when that storm was here. That storm was here and God gave us a path all the way through it. When we were at the airport, it was the hot winds that were blowing. So it's really quite a picture, isn't it? The hot winds were really blowing. And we just got out to Yarra Glen and you could see the edge of it. It was light, we saw the edge of it. And it's getting my brother out of the car and into the house. It boom, straight down on us. And as we spent the time in the house and sorting out the funeral arrangements, um, we delayed a little bit and we were told that the shorter route that we should take was full of trees and it was probably not a good idea to go through there because of, of what was coming. And what was amazing was that when we left, we hardly had, we had a little bit of rain on us, but not much, but they were saying where the worst of it was, it was coming down sideways. And it looked, as we drove, it looked like there'd been a hurricane. And if you've seen some of my pictures, there were literally trees everywhere and many of the major intersections, we'd get there and the lights went out. Melbourne intersections without lights is not really what a country driver likes to have. <laughs> and then there were trees down everywhere. And even though I grew up down that area and I knew it reasonably well, I needed Google Maps and thank the Lord that that was still working because a lot of the towers were out and I was able to re-navigate where to go because there were some places there were trees across the road and power lines were down. And so when we arrived at our destination, not only did we sigh and sigh of relief, but so did some of the family that knew that we were en route. And I just sense, what a picture is that? of the Lord's promise to us. We are in times of great shaking. But the Lord has promised us a path through the storm. He will, he says, do not be afraid, I am with you. I am with you. And he's calling us to drink out of his river to sustain us in this time. We know this season of war is getting very serious very quickly. More intense every moment. Now I have here an update on some things of Israel, if we get a chance to pray on that. Also on the back of the Songs of Ascent, you, I've written out the highlights of the three days of prayer and fasting for Israel, so you can take that. Um, so that is, is, is happening, but the Lord is providing the path for his people. But I really sense that to do that, we need to understand what we're really up against. And we have bits of ideas. But I sense there's some things that we really need to hone in on. Because even with that storm, we didn't really realise that it was hurricane winds that were blowing. We knew there was a storm, we knew there were whatever. Um, but I, I sense that we really need to know. And those of us that are following the news, we know that in the natural, Israel is in grave danger right now. Mm. Very grave danger. And everywhere, Jews are in danger. Mm. In Melbourne, they're in danger. Mm. Um, I was talking to somebody, I forget where you get all these stories, but even on the train from Bendigo to Melbourne, a Jewish person got talking and the other person found out that they were Jewish and then all of a sudden, there's the thing about, oh, but the Palestinians. And you get this whole thing just rising up. And it's, it's ugly. And the Lord is calling us to stand with them. And there's opportunities. I don't know if you saw last week, last Sunday in Sydney, 12,000 Christians and Jews gathered together in the domain to stand for Israel. There's one coming to Melbourne very soon. It'll be in Adelaide next weekend. Um... And we're working on getting one here. But it will, you know, it can be costly. But God. And it's like, do we do what the Christians did in World War II? Or do we, are we like those remnant, the few that stand and really pay the price? 
So I want to just quickly draw attention to the connection between the Hamas massacre, the Alaska Mosque, the raising of the red heifers, what Jesus said about the temple, the crisis in the global prayer movement, and the year of the dragon. Now, I've just released the article this week, and I've got a few copies here, so just one per family. It's online, it's on our website. I also spoke about it on radio last weekend, so the YouTube is up as well, so you can get the detail. But this has more information than, than all the rest because I updated it. But let me just quickly summarise. The Hamas called their massacre Alaska Flood. And you go, why on earth would they do that? What's that got to do with Gaza? And on the surface, not much, but you look into it and it's actually the root of it all. Uh, the son of Hamas said, Hamas wants an Islamic state built on the rubble of the state of Israel. They don't just want it in Israel, they want it globally. And as the saying goes, first the Sunday people, then the Sunday people. So, um, you know, we can't just say, well, that's just for Israel. The status quo, which you hear politically said about the Temple Mount, actually has its roots back in the Ottoman Empire. Um, the ancient Islamic caliphate that Turkey wants to reinstate. Now, we, under, we, especially in Australia and New Zealand, we know the Anzac story of the start of the removal of the Ottoman Empire from Israel. Um, but I just really discovered that this root is still there. And I'm wondering if this is something that the spiritual Anzacs actually need to start putting some attention to, to pray that this status quo will change. And in fact, last night I got a little bit of information just as we got home from Worship Watch. Um, so I don't think I even, it didn't even make it to there. But the, let's see if I can get this right, the Israeli courts, I think it was the High Court, has put indictments on the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem for inciting violence. Now, he's the one that preaches in the Alaska Mosque on the Temple Mount. And if this goes ahead, it could allow the Jews back to pray on the Temple Mount. So there's stuff happening. Um, but it's this sense that it's this root is there. Um, oh, I, did, I wrote it in my notes and didn't even see it. Israel State Attorney Office filed indictments against the Mufti of Jerusalem on two counts of incitement to terrorism, which could lead to the Jews being able to pray again. But within days of the um, assault, on Israel, there was trouble in the prayer movement. I hope Kansas City, you have heard of Mike Bickle and the trouble that's been happening there of stuff being exposed. And I began to wonder, Lord, is there a connection? And I'm not going to go into that situation, but I, I believe it fits with that picture of the the big um, spring at the back needs paying attention to. You know, if we've got cracks in our fuselage, you can put on a big front, but God is dealing with everything in all of us. But also, the enemy is really coming after the prayer movement because of, it, because of how effective it is. In the article, I quoted um, some of the things where uh, you heard a click uh, who was, they attempted to assassinate him, and we were just very nearby when it happened. Um, they actually said he was the most dangerous person to the Middle East because he wanted to get Jews out to pray on the, up to the Temple Mount and to rebuild the Temple. And so, hello, a house of prayer is the most dangerous thing in the Middle East. The houses of prayer is the most dangerous thing to the enemy. So I want to just have a look at the roots um, of this. The, the, the situations are complex, but the simp message is simple. I'm going to go as quickly as I can because the Lord's done a lot of what I wanted to share already. 
The Lord will not share his glory with anyone. And in Ezekiel 39 it says, When your righteous judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. And he says in Ezekiel 39, I'll make sure that my holy name is acknowledged amongst my people, Israel, that my holy name is no longer allowed to be profaned. So in all the previous scriptures, a lot of saying, I'm putting Israel into exile because of what they've done. They've forsaken me. But then I'm going to bring them back and then I'm going to deal with the nations. And he says, not because they deserve it, but for my holy name's sake, because of his word. So if we go back to the real roots before the Ottoman Turks, it's found in the scripture. Let's go to Psalm 68. I'm going to go through quite a few scriptures here. In Psalm 68, verse 15, it says, O huge, magnificent mountain, you are the mighty kingdom of God. The Zion is the mountain where God has chosen to live forever. Psalm 87, verse 1 and 2. High upon the hills of holiness stand, stands God's city. How God loves the gates of Zion, his favourite place on earth. Psalm 48, 1 to 3. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God in his holy mountain. Beautiful in elevation, you've probably seen it, the joy of the whole earth. It is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. God is in her palaces. He is known as her refuge. So where is God's chosen place? Mount Zion. The very spot that's the most contentious real estate on the planet. So why is it contentious? Well, we're going to Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 and 13. It says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. And I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. So where does he want to sit? On Mount Zion. So he's, he's said, God has said, that's my place, that's my habitation. So Elizabeth comes on and says, well, I want to sit there. And this is the tussle for Zion for Jerusalem, for the Temple Mount. And actually, this is the ancient thing that sits behind the Ottoman Turks. So we need to be declaring the word of the Lord. What has God said? I have claimed it for my habitation. In Psalm 48, what's interesting, it then goes on. We touched on it last night in the, in the worship watch. Verse 4, he then goes on, he says, I've chosen that city. He says, but see how the mighty kings united to come against Zion. See, they're picking up on what Lucifer desired. The kings, these are wicked kings. These are not good kings. Often, Scripture talks about these kings and are often the principalities of powers. And see how the mighty kings united to come against Zion. Yet, but... When they saw God manifest in front of their eyes, they were stunned. Trembling, they all fled away. Gripped with fear, seized with panic, they doubled up in frightful anguish like a woman in labour pains at childbirth. Like a hurricane blowing and breaking the invading ships, God blows upon them and breaks them to pieces. We have heard about these wonders and when we saw them with our own eyes. For this is the city of the commander of angel armies. The city of our God, safe and secure forever. Isn't that powerful? Psalm 48. So I really sense that we need to be praying Psalm 48. Because this is the very root of the whole battle. You've got God saying, this is my habitation. Lucifer saying, I'm going to sit there. He wants it, and it looks like he may have it at the moment. I found out doing this research that there's already been two earthquakes on the Temple Mount. There's another one coming. 
Smashed twice. Yes, correct. So it's like, do it again, Lord. Do it again. Because the word of the Lord says at the end of Psalm 48, these kings have come, but God manifested in their eyes, and this is the city of the commander of angel armies. He's the Lord of hosts. That's what we were singing in that song, you know, the eight, what I call the angel song, the, the song that was given through an angel, and it was calling up the hosts of heaven to battle. Psalm 76, 1 to 3. God is well known in the land of Judah. He is famous throughout Israel, making his home in Jerusalem, living here on Mount Zion. Well, listen to this, verse 3. There, that's where he smashes every weapon of war that comes against him. That's where he uses the broken arrows as kindling by his bonfire. Amen. Mm -hmm. I like that. So that's the space. So these are really important scriptures in our prayer for Israel, especially about the Temple Mount. So in other words, Hamas is saying they not only want to obliterate Israel, but the very key of it is the Temple Mount. The very key of it is the Temple Mount. That's why they call their massacre El Asqa Mosque. They don't just want Gaza or the other bits of land, they want Israel gone. Full stop. You know that. But it's after the Temple Mount. Now what did Jesus say about the Temple Mount? Well, remember in these three passages, there's Matthew 21, there's Luke 19, and Mark 11 where you can read the story. But Jesus rode from the Mount of Olives on the donkey and was walking by the clouds, remember? And from the Temple courts he drove out the money changers. And he stood in the only place that the Gentile Christian, the Gentiles could go in the temple precinct. And he quoted from Jeremiah 56, sorry, I'll get that, Isaiah 56 and Jeremiah 7. And he declared his father's house of worship would be a house of prayer for all nations. And so God has said this is my mountain, and it's going to be a house of prayer for all nations. And so this is the root of the whole thing. But let's have a quick look at what he was referring to. In the original Isaiah passage, the Lord was actually speaking to foreigners, Gentiles like us. He was, who love him and serve him. He said in Isaiah 56, 7, I will welcome you into my holy mountain. I will accept every sacrifice and offering you place on my altar. But my house of worship will be known as a house of prayer for all people. So he was saying it's not just for the Jews, it's for the Gentiles as well. So consider this, the site God has chosen for a house of prayer is the most contentious place on earth. It is clearly a spiritual and physical war zone. Men and demons contend for the site chosen by the creator of the universe as a place for his habitation. But when identifying Father's house as the house of prayer and worship, Jesus also invoked the memory of Jeremiah's prophecy by the phrase, den of thieves. And what was this about? Well, it's in Jeremiah chapter 7. Jesus was actually challenging Israel's repeated chant that is in Jeremiah 7, where they were saying, the temple of Yahweh, and they were invoking Solomon's temple like a charm to keep them safe, rather than the Lord himself. They're saying, the temple of Yahweh is here, so we are safe. But Jesus, and the Lord, the Lord through Jeremiah, but Jesus again on the temple mount, was challenging the duality of heart. And I believe this goes to this outer springs, the, 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 the two springs that we were talking about earlier. Um, because he then said in Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 8 to 11, You steal, you murder, you commit adultery, and you go after other gods, and then you come and stand in my presence. You think you can come into this house called by my name and say, We are safe, only to keep doing all these things? The temple had become a den of thieves. The den of thieves was about the duplicity of heart. The springs had become 
polluted. And this is what the Lord was saying in my dream, I believe, to me, to all of us, to the prayer movement. Clean your act up. Get your springs cleaned out. Because we're in such a time of intensity. The enemy will go after any loophole he can get off. Because he's a legalist. We know that. So it's like clean up your act. And so Jesus was invoking the prayer of the house of prayer. Don't make it a den of thieves. Do not have any duplicity. Any of your stuff needs to get out. He was chucking out the stuff from the temple. You know, it's not just having, a, you know, a church or a ministry like we do. You've got a few things to sell. And sometimes you go, well, that's what it's about. I'm not saying that you've got to be careful there. But he's, in the Jeremiah scripture, he's saying there was stealing, murdering, committing adultery. What do we do as Christians? Well, you look at the New Testament and it says slander and gossip is like murder. You know, we can steal somebody else's ideas. We can steal the glory from the Lord. And this is the things the Lord is dealing with, even within the prayer movement and many ministries. And so the Lord was saying to Israel, amend your ways, and he's saying that to us. And then he says in Jeremiah 7, now go check the rubble in Shiloh. Now some of us have. Some of us have seen the, the rubble in Shiloh. Yet for all of that, when we were there and we worshipped the Lord, there was a real strong, remember that wind that blew up as we had the holy banner out? It just blew as we worshipped the Lord. So there was still a little remnant left there. But he said, he said to Israel, you've got this duality of heart, yet you're claiming you're depending on the temple. He said, now go check out Shiloh. Look at the ruins there. And he said, the temple once stood there, but it's not there anymore as a consequence of all your actions. You've insulted the Holy One. You only used the ark again as a magic trophy mm. instead of honouring it with the fear of God. And so it's in this backdrop of Jeremiah that Luke is recording. And even in that passage where he went to the temple, Jesus was weeping over Jerusalem. And it says, and just before he spoke about the den of thieves, he was weeping over Jerusalem. Why? Jesus prophesied destruction on Jerusalem. And he said because they'd missed on their day of visitation. Jesus had come and they didn't all recognize him. And so what happened in history, it was his word was fulfilled in AD 70 when Roman soldiers under the command of Titus destroyed the second temple and the city. And so we know now that not that long after that, about 685, 715 AD, Islam filled that space. And so we know the fullness of the Lord's word there will be fulfilled. My Father's house will be a house of bread for all nations. But when we look at the background of Lucifer's desire on that place, God saying it's my habitation, this is the war. This is the war. Yes, people will get upset with each other, etc., etc. But this is the war. Who is God and who will be prayed to? It, it's this, this thing. Now, the word Lucifer mean, is Halel in Hebrew. It means the shining one, the morning star or the light bearer. But the root word is the same root word that is used for many uh, words for praise in the scripture, which is interesting. And it's the word halal, not, not, not Islamic halal. <laughs> H-A-L-A-L. And it means to shine and it's the most frequent word used in the scripture for praise. And of course he was the worship leader of heaven. So that gives us why worship is and prayer is such a battleground. Because he has been that place in heaven and wanted more. And that's a warning to us. We get into the glory space and we want more. And it's like, don't touch it. You know, when Uzzah touched the ark, it didn't end well for him. So the demonic kings and principalities are like the Prince of Persia. What happened with Daniel? 
He was praying and seeking the Lord. And Michael says, sorry, I'm a bit late, chaps. But I got held up by the Prince of Persia. These, are, these principalities was tough even for Michael. So not a good idea for us to take him. We pray. We seek the Lord. And we do all those things. But it's like, yeah. So that scripture I read about the kings united to come against Zion. And I love... Um, and what we need to also understand is this. Psalm 97 verse 7 and 9 says, Shame covers all who boast in other gods, for they worship idols. Listen to this. For all the supernatural powers, as in these um, Prince of Persia, etc., they once worshipped the true and living God. In Psalm 97 verse 7. But God's Zion people are content. They know and hear the truth. The people of praise rejoice over all your judgments, O Lord. For you are the King, the Most High God over all the earth. You are exalted above every supernatural power. So the thing about um, Lucifer, we know in Revelation 12, he's referred to as the dragon, the serpent, the ancient snake, um, who deceives the whole world. So to overcome the dragon and to heal nations, I believe we need the blood and the water. We talked about the water today, and we've often talked about the blood. In 1 John 5, 6, it says, in verse, sorry, 1 John 5, verse 6, Jesus the Messiah is the one who was revealed as God's Son by his water baptism and by the blood of his cross. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And the Spirit, who is truth, confirms this with his testimony. The Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three are in agreement. So it's the application of the blood, it's drinking of his, the water of life that we've, we've done today in this prophetic act in worship. I'm just going to go over to Revelation 12, and I know we've gone there many times, but I want to go there again in this context, in this season. It's interesting, the um, Chinese New Year finishes today, and they've initiated the Year of the Dragon. Now, I think in the context of what I'm talking about, the real battle is for a house of prayer on Mount Zion and the, the dragon. I sense this all links in with this year. Why things are really manifesting and holding up. I know one of the times we were in Israel, probably twice, maybe three times, we've been in Israel and there were trouble. Um, Rick Ridings would have visions of the dragon trying to stir up on the Temple Mount. And as they were in prayer and in worship, the Lord would give revelation and understanding of the Lord holding it back. And I think it was our first trip. Did, did we come and speak to it? I know we were in um, the Christchurch, you know, the inner you know, there, and he came and spoke to us. I can't remember which trip it was. But anyway, I know he had this vision. So this links with the, the battle for the Temple Man. So go to Revelation chapter 12, and it speaks of a woman giving birth. Um, so the first two verses, now a sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a head, a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labour and in pain to give birth. So in Matthew 24, we see the end time speaks about the labour pains, the, the, the uh, travail. And for women who've given birth to children, um, it's an interesting time of pain, then it goes away and then it comes back, and then even when you're having a second child, you go, I forgot how intense this pain was, and then there can be screaming, and then they can be like, get me out of here, I don't want to be here. And so there's all of this sort of thing that you can relate to, and I'm not saying that's what the end times are like. So here it is in, in Revelation 12, a woman giving birth, and the woman speaks of Israel giving birth to Jesus, 
But it's also speaking of the church um, giving birth to the, to the kingdom and the sons of God. I see these, you know, this is where you've got to be careful. I don't want to lump them together in one sense because you can get into replacement theology in that sense, but see them as separate, but two things that go together. And so you've got, and in Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, I think it's really interesting because it speaks there, the woman is clothed with the sun, S-U-N. Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, it speaks that Messiah, and we know that's Jesus, is the sun, S-U-N, of righteousness that arises with healing in his wings, which is the talit. So you've got this picture of the woman is clothed with the S-U-N, son of righteousness, speaking of Jesus. Um, and then it says about having the moon under her feet. And what is Islam represented by? Crescent moon. So that's, a, that's an interesting picture in itself. When we go to Revelation um, 12 verse 3, and it says, Another sign appeared, the great red, fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems. I won't go into those, but she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. Now that clearly speaks about the birth of Jesus. It also includes his death and resurrection when he's caught up to God and his throne. And within his birthing is the kingship and the kingdom rule. Well, then it's, it's like you've got many, many years into this one sentence. So you've got what happened then, and now it's then stripped straight to the end times, where the woman has to flee into the wilderness, which we understand is probably not too far away now. Uh, we believe that's where the Antichrist arises and... Um, parts of Israel will have to flee. I, I won't go into that because I don't really have a full grasp on it, but there's clearly something there where they have to get to a place of safety. But the thing that I want to hone in on um, is verse 8 and 9, which we've looked at many times, but I love this bit, and we need to be reminded of it in this season. Verse 8, the dragon did not have the power to win. It says they were having a fight, you know, in heaven. So this is Lucifer being wanting to take this place, wanting to, it's a war breaks out in heaven, it says, but he did not have power to win. Amen. Praise God. Amen. 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 And that's what we need to remind ourselves. I need to remind myself. We see the stuff happening, we get the news, and we go, oh, we're done. And it's like, no, this is, this is good. He did not have the power to win. He might win against me, but he doesn't have the power to win against God. I've got to just say one. I was in Melbourne on Wednesday, outside Melbourne Town Hall. There are a lot of Palestinians gathered. You were there then? I was in Melbourne on another thing, but I heard that night took one man. It's yes. Like last year in August, it takes one person in the ALP to say, no, we should not be here, and it got rolled. Praise, so, God. praise God. Yeah. So we just need people of courage to rise up. Amen. Amen. It was smoky scenes there, though, that night. In and Melbourne. today it's, I think, uh, half of Palestine. Now, yep. what a twisted sort of statement that is. So there's lots of it there. But the dragon did not have power to win. Does not have the power to win. And they could not reclaim their place in heaven. Verse 9. So the great dragon was thrown out down once and for all. He was a serpent, the ancient snake called the serpent, <coughs> and the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. Well, there's a lot of deception around, and Jesus said that would be the end times. He was cast down into the earth, and his angels with him. So he's got his cohort with him. Lucifer was cast out of heaven, and is contending for Israel and the church in our history and right now. But it's intensifying because the Temple Mount is the goal. The house of prayer. So where it's naturally in Israel, it is spiritually for those of us that are involved in the prayer movement. For the houses of prayer. So there's a, always a spiritual and a natural. And so this is the intensity that we are walking through for us at this minute. And we need to be very aware of it in praying for one another. 
Well, the triumphant voice continues in verse 10. Then I heard a triumphant voice. Defeated voice? Triumphant. Triumphant voice. With a fanfare. No, it's not a defeated voice. It's a triumphant voice. Proclaiming. Salvation and power are set in place and the kingdom reign of our God and the ruling authority of his anointed one are established for the accuser who accuses them day and night has been defeated. defeated. Don't you love this positive language? Being defeated. <coughs> once a cast out once and for all. They overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. We could probably say this together. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb by the word of the testimony and did not love their lives to the death. And this is a key verse for us all, as we know, that we need to press into it even more. Just like we need to press into the river more, we need to press into this verse even more. So rejoice. Woe to the earth and the sea, for the devils come down to you with great fury, because he knows his time is short. But it says that they overcame the verse we just said. So it's really an important aspect. Now we then talked about the, the dream and the, the river of God that we shared about. But I just want to encourage you, if you think about what we shared in this time of worship about the river of God and the dream I had, why did Jesus offer to the woman at the well the drink of water? Why did he offer it to her? Well, I want to suggest to you something very amazing. We touched on it when we were doing this. But Jesus was drawing her to himself as he draws us to himself. When she was transformed, her story is extraordinary. If you've looked into her story, um, this rejected woman of society who went to the well at midday when nobody goes there because it's too hot to avoid the scrutiny and the, the you know the whatever from the rest of the society. History calls her name Potini. 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 She not only led the whole city to the Lord, she went on to preach the gospel throughout the whole region. She became, even at that time, an apostle amongst the apostles. You know, for those that don't like the idea of women apostles, well, here's one that Jesus drew to himself. And so this woman was eventually brought before Nero and preached the gospel to him. She was eventually martyred, but she led many to the Lord. So the whole city there of was it Sychar, Samaria there, she led that whole city to the Lord, but she then went preaching not only through Israel but through Rome. And all because Jesus offered her a drink. Jesus offered her a cup of water, and it certainly became the fountain. And so he's, you know, saying to us, drink. And I know we've drunk before, but in this season of intense war where we feel it, we feel the battle, he's saying, drink again, drink again. Make sure that that, that spring is really cleaned out and is being filled up with the fresh water supply that only he can give us. Because, you see, what happens is our transformed lives actually give him a refreshing drink. And this is the thing that blows me away. In the Song of Solomon, chapter 4, I read it while we are in motion. With one flash of your eyes, I am undone by your love, my equal, my bride. The drinking from his water of life actually links to worship. At the, water, at, at the well, with the Samaritan woman, Straight after the, Jesus saying about giving a cup of water and about drinking, what does he then talk about? Worship in spirit and truth. They link together. And here in the Song of Solomon, he's talking about our, our fountain being for him, that, that spring being for him, and being filled by him and given to him. And 
Straight away, it speaks about worship, even in the Song of Solomon. It says, I'm overcome by merely a glance of your worshipping eyes. Isn't that extraordinary to consider that as we're in worship, as we've really got our eyes focused upon him, he is overcome by our eyes gazing into him. Isn't that just amazing? Drinking of him grows the fruits of the spirit. And in fact, Anne Hamilton suggests that the way, the key way we overcome major principalities is actually growing the fruits of the Spirit. In Christendom, we've been taught you buy and you lose and you do this and you do that and you cut and you And that's fine, there's a time for that. But we've not really focused on the growing His fruit in us, our character. Our character matters. And um, so this sense of like overcoming these really strong principalities is growing his fruit. So we only grow his fruit when we drink his water and to, to be able to nourish, nourish it. Now I'm going to go to Psalm 110 and I think this really encourages me when you're looking at warfare. Because, and this fits all together. Psalm 110. So the first three verses says, Yahweh said to my Lord the Messiah, sit with me as enthroned ruler while I subdue your every enemy. They will bow low before you as I make them a footstool for your feet. Messiah, I know God himself will establish your kingdom as you reign in Zion's glory, for he says to you, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will be your love offerings, or some translations say will be volunteers. In the day of mighty power you'll be exalted and in the brightness of your holy ones you will shine. This is an important bit. And it, as an army arising from the womb of the dawn. Remember we've talked about praying between 3 and 4 a.m. An army arising from the womb of the dawn. Have a similar on that. Anointed with the dew of the youth. And then it says in verse 5, The Lord stands in full authority to shatter to pieces the kings who stand against you on the day he displays his terrible wrath. He will, dis he will judge every rebellious nation, filling their battlefield with corpses and shattered the strongholds of ruling powers. So Jesus Messiah is dealing with um, and judging rebellious nations and dealing with these strongholds. Okay, that's the con that's the whole thing. Read the last verse in the Passion Translation. It says, yet, but, even though he's in this thing, he himself, Jesus Messiah, he himself will drink from his inheritance. As from a flowing book, refreshed by love, he will stand victorious. That's what it means for the battle of the Lord. Mm -hmm. It's not us just laying back and going, good, he'll do it all. He's saying, when we drink of his water, we allow the leaves to heal and do all these things. And we allow his fruit to grow in us. He, the Son of Solomon, is refreshed by our worshiping eyes. When he's in the thick of battle for these strongholds, he needs to drink from us. That's what our worship does for him. He is refreshed in the thick of battle by our worship. And I believe if we get a hold of this understanding, it will change our perspective when we come to worship the Lord. We're not just coming, we know that we're not just coming for our own sake, but how often that's the attitude. I know you guys don't, but, it's, but that's often the attitude. But he wants us to understand in this fierce battle yeah. for the prayer, house of prayer, 
in Jerusalem but throughout the nations. The number one task we have is to drink of his water, produce his fruit so that he is strengthened for the battle. Yes, we will be strengthened for the battle too. We know we do because when we're in his presence, such a shalom comes, doesn't it? Such a shalom comes, so it's like, but he needs to be strengthened for the battle. Because he's overcome and strengthened by a glance from our worshiping Christ. Amen. Now I want to quickly give you 12 strategies when major principalities are off operating. Now in a sense I've already given it to you, but I'm just going to give you very quickly in 12 points. Number one, submit to God before resisting the devil. Before we start binding and loosing and cutting and shooting arrows or whatever else. It says in James 4, he gives grace to the humble he resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit, surrender to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. In other words, we submit to God first, then we worry about resisting the devil. Very often we do it the other way around. We can resist God and even be in agreement with the enemy. But, um, now we've got to submit to God. So drinking of his living water so our worshipping eyes strengthen him so that he can drink from his inheritance. You know, he says, if you love me, do what I call you to do. So that's that submitting to God. Number two, we war from a place of rest. In Genesis chapter 1, it says God created evening and then there was morning. In Hebrews 4, 9-11, it says he entered his rest by ceasing from his works, which is what the Shabbat's about. And he's also, in a, sorry, Hebrews 4, he's telling us to cease our works. And it's interesting in Hebrews 4, he's talking about coming into the place of rest. And when he gets to the place of ceasing our works and coming into our rest, what does he go straight into? He talks about the sword of the Spirit to be able to battle with it. And we tend to want to pick up the sword and start wielding it before we've actually come into the place of rest. And so in the, in the Hebrew day, that's where they start the day in the evening as the Lord did a creation, from evening and then morning. So you rest first, then you go to work. We in our Greek mindset is different. We work and then we rest. <laughs> it's just like, but it's... But it's actually, you may think it's only a way of looking at it, but it actually changes a lot of things when you come from a place of rest. Number three, war from intimacy. And that's really what we've been talking about as being in this place. But if you go back to Song of Solomon's chapter four, this is what he says to the bride. He said, you've now, she says, I'm, I'm now ready to climb this fearful mountain. And he says, now you're ready. We're going to climb the highest peaks together. Come with me through the archway of trust. We will look down uh, from the summit of our sanctuary, from the lion's den and the leopard's lair. For you reach into my heart. And that's when he says, the glance of the worshiping eyes. And in Psalm 18, it says in verse 33, Through you I ascend to the highest peaks to stand strong and secure in you. You've trained me with the weapons of warfare worship. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. You empower me for victory with your wraparound presence. Your power within makes me stronger to subdue. So, it, and by stooping down in gentleness, you made me great. You placed your armor on me and made my enemies bow low at my feet. So he's saying in the intimacy, we, we, we go up in intimacy, in worship, and then we come together in the lion's lairs and the leopard's lairs to, to, to come into this place of warfare. So we war from a place of intimacy. Number four, do not attempt to bind or cast out these major principalities that are operating. They are not lowly demons. That's what you do with lowly demons. You don't do it with principalities. 
The example of the warning is in Job chapter 41 about Leviathan. You can read it, so it talks about, about Leviathan and all about it. And in verse 8 it says, Lay your hand on him, remember the battle, and never do it again. Indeed, any hope of overcoming him is false. Shall one not be overwhelmed at the sight of him? No one is so fierce that he would dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand against him? So there's great warning about trying to take Leviathan on, but it does say in the scripture in um, Isaiah and in Psalm that the Lord takes his sword and takes its head off. So I'm happy to declare what the scripture says and, and ask the Lord to do it. Is that a good idea? Amen. Okay, ask the Lord to do it. And what we do is submit to Him, and as we're in that worship, and He's getting refreshed, then we can ask Him to do that at the appropriate time. And as I said, the example of, of uh, Daniel when he was praying, the Prince of Persia was opposing the prayer, and Michael had to come in. And so the Word says that as we and declare the word, the angels respond to the word of God and they will go and do it for us. So there's a great partnering with, with the angelic armies right now. N number five, this is really important. Do not dishonour the principalities. They are actually fallen guardians. I read that scripture of Psalm 97. For all the supernatural powers at once worship the true and living God. They are fallen beings. And um, it says in Jude chapter 1 verse 9, Even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil over the body of Moses, dared not insult or slander him or accuse him, but simply said, The Lord rebuke you. And so even Michael did not bring a railing accusation, but he, he just at an appropriate time says, The Lord rebuke you. One of the things Anne Hamilton states very, very clearly is that a lot of times people get into trouble, these um, principalities like Leviathan, Python, Belial, Ziz, Jezebel, um, is because there's dishonour. We've dishonoured the Lord or one another or ourselves. Um, there's all sorts of ways that can happen, but dishonouring even these things in warfare, I've seen people get really badly hurt when they pull out the sword and go for it unwisely. And so I'm not saying don't get into spiritual warfare, but I'm saying we need to be careful because right now these are major principalities that are operating in the earth. And so we need to use the wisdom of God in it. Now one of the things, for example, in Jezebel, it says in Revelation, what does it say? Don't tolerate her. And when we tolerate, that's, that's a way to overcome it. Don't tolerate it. And so that's sometimes harder than anything else. Um, so submitting to God, it's, it's just, is it's a key thing, but also to find out where have I been complicit in being in agreement with this thing? You know, like with Jezebel, have we tolerated it? So when we, if we find what we have, I shouldn't say if we find, we generally have, um, to repent of it and to apply the blood to it so that there's no den of thieves in us or duplicity. Credibility and integrity matter. Number six, seek, wait. Even under fire, don't panic, I've got to move and do something. It's very easy to do that and probably the younger you are that you do that, as you get older you tend to go, no, won't you? I think of, um, you know the dogfight pilots? Have you ever seen those aerobatic things? And they fly straight at the other aircraft, and only at the last second that they switch off, and you go, "Whoa, you need nerves of steel to do that." But that's that's the thing of knowing when to move, and the timing of God is really important as to um, what He shows us to do. But it's like sometimes when we're under fire, we're like, "No, we've got to do this, we've got to do that." But sometimes the Lord's saying, "Wait." Now, even these last few months where I felt the Lord said to wait and to rest, I felt, and I'll tell you why, apart from stuff happening in our family, I sensed the war was going to intensify this year and I needed to be rested for what's coming. I need to be rested for what is a, you know, what we're going to be required of us. And so, yes, there was things happening in our family. But it was like I really needed to rest. But also the season's changing. 
and trying to see what is God saying to us. So this thing of seeking and waiting is really important. Number seven, knowledge of the Holy One of Israel. That came through in worship again today. Honouring his name behind closed doors is really important, not just when you're in the platform. Mm. Honouring him behind closed doors where no one else sees it. And that's part of the submitting to him. Number eight, I really want to stress this. I believe the house of prayer is the new wineskin. Mm. It is the new wineskin. Yeah. And so, number one, we need to build with his wisdom, but also this will get a really an impact, especially for Christians that are so set into the denominations and, and the way of doing things. And so, because Jesus said, Father's house will be a house to pray for all nations, correct? Yeah. And with what I'm seeing across the earth with the prayer movement and now the contention for it, it's not that it's over, I believe this is the new wineskin. Because what are we meant to do when we come together? To worship Him and to pray. And to hear the Word. Um, so there's a whole lot of things. I really believe the prayer house, the, the house of prayer, is the new wineskin. When I say prayer, that word means prayer and worship. Number nine, I believe we need to upgrade how we pray. Um, I know we've talked about this many times, but what Father is saying, not presumption, not just pulling out our favourite scripture that was worked the last time. <laughs> it's easy to do, easy to do. Number 10, pray shields in place. I, I believe praying for one another is really key. I, I saw a graphic recently, and I, sorry I haven't got it to put it up there, but it basically showed all these shields interlocked. And so it wasn't just praying for the leader, that's important, but it's praying for the people that stand around them. So it's like praying for one another becomes really important because the enemy wants to knock you out so that you can't stand with him. He wants to knock you out so you can't stand here. He wants to knock, you know, he wants to knock the person who's standing beside us out so that we can't stand. So we need to really update the prayer shield. And I'm actually asking the Lord for some practical things there to help us. Number 11, no Hebrews chapter 11. Sorry, Hebrews chapter 12. No Hebrews chapter 12. I believe it's a critical scripture and I'm going to go through it verse by verse tomorrow on radio. So um, I really believe you need to take hold of Hebrews 12. It's a key scripture. Hey? Pre plate for tomorrow. Pre plate for tomorrow, yeah. <laughs> um, and number 12, remember what Jesus said about the end times. You will be persecuted when you love him. Now, I know we don't like to hear that one, but he did say we would be persecuted because we love him. He said, if they persecute him, but persecute us. So, in his time of great shaking, he will give us the path through the storms. Oh, there's a beautiful scripture for me to tie this up with Romans 15, 13. It says, Now may God, the inspiration and the fountain of hope, fill you to overflowing with uncontainable joy and perfect peace as you trust in him. And may the power of the Holy Spirit continually surround your life with his superabundance until you radiate with joy. Amen, amen. and amen. amen. Praise God. It is a time for building the houses of prayer. A report came through the Australian Prayer Network this week. Taiwan, under threat from China, it's been reported that this week some 40,000 prayer groups have sprung up across Taiwan. Wow, wow. And they are aiming for 300,000 and going 24-7. So it's awful that we have to get so desperate in such a terrible place. And the same with Israel, that they're now having these three days of prayer and fasting. So we're, we're similar, aren't we? we 
When, when life is reasonably comfortable, it's hard for us to put the extra effort in, isn't it? But when life is desperate, when there's war at your doorstep, it's amazing the priorities that we get straight. So it's interesting that they're in Taiwan. Um, that's their desperation. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the revelation you're releasing at this time, that you're helping us to see what we're facing, but what it is you want from us in this hour. Lord, we just thank you. You are saying to us today to come and drink. Drink from you and to take hold of your blood. And we thank you, Lord, that you do do the fighting for us when we position ourselves at your feet. And we just thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and your strength. And I pray, Lord, for a release of joy in this house, a release of great joy today, a release of joy for every single one of us. You said the joy is our strength, and the joy is one of your fruits. So, Lord, we want to eat of you today, eat of your joy and take hold of it, and that is we drink from your river, Lord, as we drink from your water, that, Lord, your joy would fill us to overflowing. Fill us to overflowing with your joy. Your joy, joy, joy. Just receive his joy today. Receive his joy. Let his joy just wash over you like, you know, just like you're in the river and water splashing all over you. Let that joy just take off the dirt and the residues of the tough stuff of the week. Lord, we just thank you. Thank you that your splashes of water just wash off, wash off the heartaches, wash off the fears, wash off the strife and the contentions and fill us afresh today with your joy, joy, joy. Thank you, Lord, your joy. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Amen. Just, there's an old song that you say this in there. Mm. Is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. Is joy unspeakable and full of glory, and my heart has never yet been told. Recovering all.
bless each household with shalom, with grace, with great joy and abundance, Lord. And we pray now, Lord, too, that you would just forbid backlash and revenge of the end. Today, Lord, as we go from here, we will be filled up with you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.